Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Robert Mitchum and Lorraine Day in Holiday Affair. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I hope you all have your Christmas shopping done. There are only five more hectic days left, you know, and then your troubles will be over. But uh, just suppose when you walk into the toy department, instead of seeing Santa Claus, you become involved with a tall, handsome stranger. Well, that's only the beginning of tonight's play, Holiday Affair. As the stars of this RKO holiday treat, we have Robert Mitchum, who lends his special talents to recreating his original role. And starring with him is Lorraine Day, who we managed to lure back to Hollywood to give one of her fine performances for us in Holiday Affair. And when you're doing your grocery shopping for the holidays, we hope Lux Toilet Soap will be on your list. Women who value their lovely complexions only know they need purchase and use Lux Toilet Soap once, and it will always be at the top of their list for gentle beauty care. Now, Holiday Affair, starring Robert Mitchum as Steve and Lorraine Day as Connie. It's rather important to any large department store, especially at Christmas time, to know just what's going on at its competitors. A job entrusted to a group of experts known as uh, comparison shoppers. Right now, there's a comparison shopper in the toy department of Crowley and Company. Could you wait on me, please? I know exactly what I want. I want one of these electric trains. Well, now let me tell you something about this train. As you can see from this model... I'll it's a... take it, complete with accessories. I don't have to convince you? No, thanks. Well, that'll be seventy-nine fifty plus tax. I have exactly the amount right here. Oh, and I'll take it with me, please. Uh, we'll be glad to send it. It's pretty heavy. No, if you'll just put it in a box. All right. If you'll take this sales slip, you can pick the train up at the call desk. Thank you very much. Oh, can you tell me where there's a phone booth, please? Oh, phones? Uh, right next to the elevator. Thank you. Hello, Miss Neely? This is Connie Ennis. Well, I have a report on those 54-gauge nylons. Gimbals and Bloomingdale's have exactly the same shade and price as we do. Crowley's? Well, that's where I am now. I just bought the train, and I, I was wondering if, if I could wait until morning to bring it in. It, it's getting awfully late, and, and the lady who takes care of my little boy... Oh, thanks a lot, Miss Neely. See you in the morning. Well, good evening, Mrs. Ennis. Well, good evening, Mr. Ennis. Oh, darling, it is good to see you. Mommy, look, look, I lost another tooth. Well, I should say you did. I put it on your dresser. You can save it for me. He's been a very good boy, Mrs. Ennis. Oh, hello, Mary. Dinner's all ready. All you have to do is heat it up. I don't know what I'd do without you, Mary. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. Good night, Timmy. Good night, Mary. Gee, all those packages. Are they for me for Christmas? Well, one of them might be. The big one, huh? No, not the big one, dear. That's for the store business. Mm. Now, let me look at you. You know, Mr. Ennis, you're more and more like your daddy every day. Mom, does it hurt much to die like daddy did? No, I don't think so, darling. Well, did Carl telephone? Mm -hmm. He said he'd be over later. Well, that's nice. Now, while I add a few elegant touches to our dinner, suppose you run along and wash. You bet, Mrs. Ennis. And keep away from my packages. There's an electric train in this one. I know it. I can hear the tracks. Timmy! Coming. I can't help, Mommy. I just feel so good. That package isn't for you, darling. Oh, sure. I know. I know. Now, look, honey. Christmas is wonderful, but, but most of the time, it, if you wish for real big things, all you're going to get are, are real big disappointments. Yeah, I... I guess you're right. Now, Scoot. Oh, did Carl say what time he'd be here? Oh, uh, just after dinner, I guess. 
All right, all right. Hand me a dish towel and put me to work. Now, here's the kind of man I like, Timmy. He gets here just in time to do the dishes. Getting all set for Christmas, Timmy? Yeah, kind of, I guess. Well, we'll go out tomorrow and pick out a tree, huh? Can I really help to pick it out? I wouldn't have it any other way. We might even sneak in a movie if I can leave the office early enough. Gee, thanks. I, I think I'll go to bed, Mom. I'm kind of tired. Well, if you want to, darling... Just don't forget to feed your turtles and brush your teeth. Do I have to brush where the last one came out? <laughs> no, you brush around where the last one came out. Good night, darling. Good night, Mom. Good night, Carl. See you tomorrow, Timmy. <laughs> you know I wear everybody out at the office with the things he says. I may as well warn you that compliments will get you no place. The dishes. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know we make a pretty good team at the kitchen sink. Why limit it to the kitchen sink? Marry me and I'll buy you a dishwasher. A cute little Frenchman with a tight <laughs> skirt. What do you say, Connie? Could you give me a little more time, Carl? Well, you've had almost three years. You've got to have someone to buy loud neckties for at Christmas. <laughs> I sure used to buy guys some buttes. Oh, how he must have hated wearing them. Oh, he loved wearing them, just like I would. Carl, I like you very, very much. You know that, but, but I don't feel... Now, that... look. As a lawyer, I got a lot of divorces for a lot of people, Connie. But I never got a divorce for two people who really liked each other. But there's Timmy, Carl. Are you sure Are that you... Are you trying to talk me out of this? I promise you won't have to ask me again. If it's yes, I'll ask you. Does it feel like yes? Sort of. Well, this isn't getting the dishes done. You know, I'll never forget the day you hired me. There I was sitting at the employment agency with all the other girls. <laughs> What are you doing still awake? Mm, just thinking. Is Carl still here? No, darling, he just left. Carl wants me to marry him, Timmy. Are you going to? I might. Why? Oh, for a lot of reasons, dear. We could be a real family. But I like us the way we are. I don't want anything to change. But we'd be the same, Timmy. Only better. Well, we'll talk about it some other time, hmm? Good night, Mr. Ennis. You too, Mrs. N. But if you marry Carl, you won't be Mrs. Ennis anymore. No, darling. Not anymore. Oh, good morning. May I help you? Oh, oh, hello. Well, uh, I, I... Never mind. Let me guess. You came to return the electric train, huh? It wasn't exactly what I wanted, and I... No, I, I didn't think it would be. Well, when I got home last night, my little boy said that it was oh, just... Oh, it was for your little boy. Anything so strange about that? What's your little boy's name? Macy's? Sachs? Gimbel's? Uh, Lewis and Fisher, maybe? Now, look, will you please just... Honey, I tagged you yesterday as a comparison shopper. You didn't ask a single question about the train. You had the exact amount already, tax included. You didn't even want it wrapped. What are you going to do? The same as they do over in your store. I press this little button. A store detective rushes up and he takes your picture. We show it to every sales clerk, and that ends your activities in Crowley and Company. It ends my activities in Fisher and Lewis, too. I get fired. Well, if you're going to be a spy, you've got to expect the firing squad. My little boy ends up getting his shoes from the Children's Aid Society, and you're a great big hero. Yeah, I thought we'd be getting back to little Butch. His name is Timothy. He's seven years old, and I support him. What does your husband do, working his way through college? My husband's dead. He was killed in the war. Would you uh, like to hit me over the head with this locomotive? Well, now what? Now I write you a refund slip, which I have a feeling I'm going to live to regret. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Name? Ennis. Connie Ennis. I'm awfully grateful. My job means a great deal to mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Address? 550 East 75th Street. Now you can do me a favor. There are 47 other departments in this store. Don't come back to this one, okay? Okay. Now then, madam, I believe you're next. Yes, I'd like to see the union suit you advertise. Ribbed cotton, fleece lined, long-sleeved, and I believe it also Darling, you remember. What? Oh, it's you. And now the size, madam. Uh, oh, for your husband here? Well, I'd say about a 42 or oh, 44. Oh, no. No, I want the special, the 56. Uh, yeah, 56. Oh, uh, yes. Well, uh, this may take me a minute, sir. Well, still engaged in commercial espionage, I see. Well, I'm staying out of your department. But what are you doing down here? I just got fired. Oh, no. 
because of me? I was supposed to report you, you know. It's a rule. Little floor walkers have big ears. Well, I- is there anything I can do? There certainly is. When I was a working man, I used to eat lunch about now. I'll buy your lunch. I'll be glad to. Uh, that's roughly what I had in mind uh, on one condition. I take you to my favorite restaurant, and I order for both of us. I'm entirely in your hands. Here we have the 56, madam. <laughs> it's the only one left, but I found it. It's exactly what I want. I'll pick it up later. Yeah. But, madam, I, really? Well, well, I ask you, 56? So I like them loose. <laughs> your favorite restaurant, huh? Central Park. A lot of seals splashing in the water. And hot dogs and coffee for lunch. Oh, uh, care for dessert? I've got some peanuts. <laughs> no, thanks. I'm doing fine. You see that seal? Mm-hmm. Now, there's the happiest guy in New York. And he's never wanted to be vice president of the First National Bank. Well, do you? Me? <laughs> not me either. I just want to build boats. Boats? Yeah. Well, not the Queen Mary. Little boats, sailboats. Well, then why aren't you doing it? Well, for one thing, the war nipped about five years out of my life. Then, later, I made the mistake of listening to people. Do something sensible, they said. Sell real estate or washing machines or mouse traps, but cut a few throats and wind up vice president. So I got me a nice, cozy job with a bank. Two years later, I woke up. In Crowley's toy department? <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? Well, it's like this. I've got a good friend out in Oregon. He, he owns a little boat yard, and I'm buying into it. So now I just take any job I can get. Every time I get $100, I send it to him. It may never make a million for me, but it's more fun than digging for oil in Texas or coal in Kentucky or cutting throats in a bank. Oh, my gosh, the time. If you'd told me that anyone could keep me for two hours over a couple of hot dogs... Where do you have to go? Want to make us house furnishings. Say, do you always make people talk this much? <laughs> no, and I don't always like listening this much. Do you mind if I tag along to Wanamaker's? Sure, you can carry all the packages. Oh, fine, fine. <laughs> Look, lady, I wish I could help you, but I'm only the doorman. But we were coming out of the store just now. He had all my packages. We got separated in those darn revolving doors. Oh, well, how old is the little boy? He's not a little boy. He's a grown man with with about 15 packages. Steve! Steve! Oh, for heaven's sake, I... What's going on here? Connie, oh, darn it. We wanted to have the tree all trimmed by the time you come home. And I picked it out, Mom, by myself. <laughs> After a double hot fudge Sunday to give him strength. Well, it, it's the most beautiful Christmas tree I've ever seen. You're a fine picker outer, Mr. Ennis. Say, how come you're home so early? I never did get back to Lewis and Fisher. Oh, I, I misplaced some packages at Wanamaker, so, so there was no point in going back till I found them. Carl, did anyone telephone about them? Uh Uh-uh. Oh, we let Mary go home early. We're taking you out to dinner. Well, you're a very pleasant man. How about changing your clothes, Timmy? Yeah, come on. Let's see how fast you can do it. I know, I know. You just want me to go so you can kiss her. (laughs) Now, how would he know about that? Well, what are you waiting for? Oh, I feel as lit up as that Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. Connie, you told Timmy about us. What did he say? Well, you know how children are. They don't like changes. But I'm sure he's... Front door, excuse me. Who is it? Maybe you'd rather I come down the chimney. Steve! Well, where did you go to, a matinee? I looked all over for you. It's the last time I ever pick up a comparison shopper. Here, let me help you with the packages. Well, uh, hello. Oh, uh, Carl, this is Steve. Uh, Mason. Uh, Carl Davis. Hi. Uh, I lost her in the crowd. We were out shopping. We got separated. Got... We met at Crowley's this morning, and then we went... She got out... me fired, and then we started... That's to how we met. And after lunch, he, he, he was carrying all those parcels for me, and we got separated in the crowd. Well, it can happen in the crowd, yes. <laughs> uh, but how did you find me? Well, it wasn't easy. This may come as a big shock to you, but Fisher and Lewis never even heard of you. Naturally, they never give out information about comparison shoppers. And then it dawned on me to look in the phone book. Uh, dear, why don't I get Mr. Mason a drink? Hey, this fellow's got it upstairs. I'll get us all one, huh? Sit down, won't you? Well, it looks as though we might have a white Christmas. That's right. 
Never seems like Christmas unless it is white. That's right. Still, we don't seem to get the big snows we used to. That's right. Just comes down slush now. That's right. It's probably got something to do with the atom bomb. Hey, that's right. Understand they need rain in California. That's so. I'm from California. Is that so? Never rains. I was in California once. That's so. Rained every day. Very unusual. Uh, that photograph on the table, is, uh, is that guy? Yeah. Yeah, and Tim's a lot like him, Connie says. Tim's her little boy. Yeah, I know. Oh? He never knew his father, did he? No. No, but Connie talks about Guy all the time. That's wonderful the way she keeps him, well, sort of alive. Is it? After all, he's not alive. Huh? Oh, oh, here, here, let me help you, dear. Thanks. Here you are, Mason. Thank you. Well, here's to a Merry Christmas. That's what I always say. Oh, here's Timmy. Steve, I'd like you to meet the man of the house, Mr. Ennis. Hi, Tim. Hi. He looks exactly like you. Oh, do you think so? Everyone else says he's the image of his father. Timmy, I've got to ask you a couple of questions. I'm sorry, but it's a rule for grown-ups. Like how old I am and what grade I'm in? <laughs> That's right. Then when you get older, you'll have the right to be annoying to kids. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, what are you going to get for Christmas? Clothes, I guess. That's what I always get. Something to wear. Well, I'll bet you won't be able to wear what I'm getting for you. A camera. How'd you know? Because you asked me if I wanted one a long time ago. Timmy, I don't think that, that sounds very nice. Oh, he didn't mean it that way. Anyway, he doesn't have to get me anything. Timmy, just for that, you can go straight to your room. No. Tim. Now, you do what your mother tells you. I don't want to, and you can't make me. Timmy! Oh, now, wait a minute, son. I'm not your son. You keep your old camera. Now, here, here. You better go to bed. And keep your hands off me and off my mother, too. Let me go. Let me go. Carl, get your hands off my boy. Connie. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Good night, Connie. Carl, wait. Wait. I'm sorry. I'd better go, Connie. Good night. Go to bed, Timmy, and, and you don't get any supper. I'm sorry, Steve. Yeah, so am I. I come to return a few packages, and look what happens. It didn't have anything to do with you. Oh? You didn't tell Carl about me. It wasn't important. Well, maybe not telling him made it seem important. He certainly went out of his way to take possession of Timmy. That may be why the kid flared up. No. No, I don't think so. Well, I wanted to see the Ennises at home. And you certainly saw them. And now I'll say goodbye. I, I think it'll save us both a lot of trouble. Now, what does that mean? It means that I might fall in love with you. Well, it's not impossible. I might even ask you to marry me one day, and you'd say no. Not that you're not right, but what makes you so sure? Because you want everything just as it is. The status quo. You and Timmy. No changes. Well? Connie, look. He's a wonderful kid. Stop trying to make him over into your husband. I don't know what you're talking about. You call him the man of the house, Mr. Ennis. You get upset when somebody doesn't think he looks like his father. Why don't you quit trying to hang on to something you've lost? I want everything just as it is, do I? I suppose that's why I'm marrying Carl. Well, if you do marry him, you're going to have a little problem with Tim, aren't you? No, I'm not. It will take a little time, maybe, but, but you're not quite as wise as you think you are. Okay, okay, I'm on my way. Uh... Do you mind if I say goodbye to Tim? Go ahead if you want to. Thanks. Steve? Hello, Timmy. I'm sorry I was bad before. Boy, you can sure kick up a fuss, can't you? You think Carl's real mad at me? No. You just tell him you're sorry. I bet he's a pretty nice guy. Steve, did Mom really get you fired? Hey, how did you know about that? I, I can hear things through the door sometimes. Uh-huh, especially, especially when you put your ear next to it, huh? Well, it seems I sold your mom a train, and then when she brought it back, I, I did something I wasn't supposed to do. You mean an electric train, red and silver, with a, with a whistle on the... Oh, you saw it, huh? Yeah, but don't tell Mom. I, I peeked. I thought it was for me, but it wasn't. Gee, it sure was a swell train. Well, maybe next year, huh? You keep wishing real hard till next Christmas. I've wished for a train till my stomach hurts. But Mom took it back anyway. Well, that shouldn't make a big fellow like you quit. Well, I'll go see if I can't rustle up some supper for you. Oh, don't worry. Well, I'm bad. Mom gives me supper anyway. <laughs> Good night, Steve. Good night, Timmy. Keep pitching. Merry Christmas, Connie. <gasps> 
did you have to do that? You sure scare easy. It was just a goodbye kiss. Good luck, Connie. In a few moments, we'll continue with Act Two of Holiday Affair. And now, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter, to bring us the Lux Radio Theater's movie news of the week. Exciting news tonight, John. Metro Golden Mayer's picture about one of our greatest Americans will have its world premiere Wednesday night in Hollywood. The Magnificent Yankee is the life story of Chief Justice Holmes, starring Louis Calhoun and Anne Harding. And believe me, Magnificent describes it. When I saw the preview, I wanted to stand up and cheer. I know how you felt, Libby. It makes you proud to be an American. Oh, it's as exciting as the 4th of July. There's one fascinating scene after another to show the high points of Holmes' career in our nation's capital. The sets are really authentic. The Supreme Court chambers, the Capitol building, the inside of the Holmes' house. But more than that, it's a warm and tender love story. Just as Holmes was like many great men... He had the devotion of a wonderful wife to inspire him. I think Anne Harding, as Mrs. Holmes, shares the honors with Louis Calhern, don't you? Oh, definitely. She does a superb acting job, and she looks the part to perfection with her patrician beauty. It's good to see Anne Harding back in The Magnificent Yankee. Yes, indeed. You know, till recently, she's been completely taken up with her stage work. Well, she's as lovely as ever. A true blonde with features like a cameo. Of course, John, she has to give that delicate skin of hers the finest kind of care. Naturally, she always uses Lux toilet soap. Screen stars can't take chances with million-dollar complexions. No wonder they depend on this beauty soap with active lather. Yes, because Lux soap's active lather cleanses thoroughly, but very gently, too. It gives skin such quick new loveliness. All you do is work the rich lather well in... Rinse with warm water, follow with a cold rinse, then pat dry with a soft towel. It's a beauty treatment that does wonders for the skin. Women everywhere find that's true. Daily Lux Soap Care can make skin softer, smoother, really lovelier. If you haven't tried it, take a tip from Hollywood's most glamorous stars. Next time you shop, get a supply of this fragrant white soap. See if you aren't delighted with the radiant new beauty it will give your skin. Remember, nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. Now, Mr. William Keeley, our producer. Act two of Holiday Affair, starring Robert Mitchum as Steve and Lorraine Day as Connie. It's noon the following day, the day before Christmas. Connie and Carl have met for lunch and, it appears, have patched up their differences. Once again, Connie, I'm so sorry about last night. It was all my fault. I don't know why I didn't tell you about meeting Steve. It wasn't Steve that bothered me, honey. It was that, uh, that take your hands off my boy. But you know I didn't mean that. Timmy's such a swell kid. You know, he even called me up this morning. Timmy? Yes, yes. He said he was sorry and that I shouldn't be mad at him and, well, a lot of other nice things. Oh, I'm so glad. You see, I didn't tell him to call you. It was his own idea. And that means that I that I can ask you something. Well? Will you marry me, Carl? I mean, soon. New Year's Day. Connie. Or are you going to play hard to get? Oh, Connie. Oh, at last. Say, look. Look, we'll pick up Timmy later and we'll have that dinner out that we didn't have last night. And then when Timmy's fast asleep, you and I'll sit on the sofa and nap. <laughs> Is that what married people do? Well, if they don't, let's set a precedent, huh? <laughs> hey, waiter, how about that check? Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. Mommy, where are you? It's Christmas morning. I'm getting breakfast for you, which you'll probably never eat. Oh, Merry... Merry Christmas, darling. Oh, Mom, thank you. You sure did fool me. I did? Tell me I wouldn't get anything wonderful for Christmas. It was outside the door where I want to get the milk. Oh, gosh, Mom. Outside the door? In here, Mom, in here. I'll show you. A rocket express train. And there's a note in the box. You put it in, but you forgot. I can't read very good. Let me see that note. Timmy, this train whistled at me when I passed by and said it wanted you for Christmas. 
It's signed Santa. Santa Claus. Oh, and this is for you. We'll open it up. Jimmy, for me? It's perfume, real perfume. It costs more than a dollar. Oh, Jimmy. Oh, it's just beautiful, darling. You're surprised, huh? <laughs> Am I? But, but how did you know I wanted the train so bad? I didn't tell anyone except Mr. Mason. Mr. Mason? Timmy, Timmy, about this train... Oh, darling. And I'm going to take better care of my clothes from now on. And wash more, too. Jimmy, I didn't get you the train. Well, who did? Mr. Mason. Gee, he must be awful rich. No, dear, he's not. That train's the nicest thing anybody ever did for me. Except for you, I mean. Gosh, I'll have to thank him. Well, I may be able to do that for you. I have a few things I'd like to talk to him about. I'll go with you. But Mary will be here soon, and then Carl and, and Grandpa and Grandma... Mom, and we don't coming. have any present for him. For Mr. Mason, I mean. I'm afraid we don't, dear. And the stores are all closed today. There's a lot of presents he might like under the tree. Those are for Carl. Well, we'll talk about it later, hmm? Now sit down and eat your cornflakes. But where are you going? I think I'd better telephone Carl. Timmy with a spoon, dear. And not so fast. Connie, well, I'm amazed. What brings you to Central Park on Christmas morning? Because you weren't at your hotel. Oh, I don't live there anymore. So the clerk told me. Then I, I thought maybe you'd be here. Have some breakfast? The squirrel and I think this stuff's pretty good. The squirrel? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. He's an orphan. I'm all he has in this world. <laughs> Steve, why did you get that train for Timmy? Because I wanted to. Well, it, it was very sweet of you, but I, I just can't let you do it. I want to give you back the money. Some of it now, and, and, uh, and the uh, rest uh, is... I'm sorry. The train is strictly a personal matter between my friend and me. But, Steve, really... Uh, anyway, it isn't right for Timmy to think he's always going to get everything he asks for. Well, for a kid that's been sold on no surprises at all, it seemed like a great idea. Well, he's just crazy about it. And about you, too. Oh, he sent you a present. No. He wanted to hand it to you personally, really? but... Really? Now, how did he know that I like noisy neckties? Oh, this I've got to wear right now. I'll just take this old one off. Hey, Mac. Yeah? You want a necktie? Yeah, sure. Well, what do you know? Christmas is here after all. And many of them. Thanks a lot, mister. Well, now you've made two people happy for Christmas and one person a little unhappy. Oh? Carl. He suspects your motives about the train. Well, so would I if I were in his shoes. I'm marrying Carl on New Year's Day. Good for you. He looks like a nice guy. Oh, he is. I know, Carl. We've been friends for so long, and now everything will be safe and secure. I, I feel just wonderful about it. <laughs> You're great at selling yourself a bill of goods, aren't you? Look, Steve, I... You were married once to a man you were in love with. You ought to know it's impossible to be safe and secure when you're in love. What are you trying to do, crawl into a cave and hide from everything that's going to stir you up? If I want to, yes. Well, I don't think you can. Life is going to crawl right in there with you and kick your teeth out. I'll manage very well, thank you. You've got to take everything that's coming to you, Connie. All the surprises, good and bad. I can't afford surprises. Every surprise isn't a telegram from the war department. I should have known it was a mistake to see you again. Then why did you come here? I told you why. To pay you back for the train. You could have mailed it to me. A three-cent stamp would take care of the whole thing. Look, Steve, I came because I... I just... Mister! Hey, mister! Hi. Are you the man who gave that man a necktie? That's right. Now, what's that balloon tied onto your head for? Oh, my brother tied it on, and now I can't get it off. Well, the man said it was very nice of you to give him a Christmas present, and he said he wants to give you this one. He did? Uh-huh. So here. Well, I gotta go now. Hey, Milton, wait for me! Well, what do you suppose is in here? Well, nothing like finding out. And where would he have got it? Maybe he's an eccentric millionaire. After all, everyone who wears dirty old clothes isn't a hobo. Just like everyone who gives electric trains to strange kids isn't an eccentric millionaire. Look, just what I needed. Salt and pepper shakers. Mm. Steve, not to change the subject, but why did you move out of the hotel? Because I found a cheaper place. 
I'm going to stick around just long enough to earn my train fare to Oregon so you can stop worrying about me. I'm not worrying oh, about you. All right, so Carl can stop worrying. Look, since I'm not going to see you again, can't you have the decency not to be annoying? Sure. Goodbye, Connie. Have yourself a nice, quiet life. Thank you. Goodbye, Steve. <laughs> brought me. Connie. Father. Mother. Oh, it, it's so good to see you again. Oh, Merry Christmas, <laughs> Merry darling. Christmas. You look wonderful, uh, honey. And this boy of yours. Oh, mm. Connie, he's getting to look more like Guy every time I see him. Did Mr. Mason like his present? Yes, dear, I think so. Oh, yes, your young man, Connie. We're looking forward so much to meeting him. Oh, Timmy's told us all about him. We're very happy for you, Connie. Oh, now, wait a minute. Timmy's a little mixed up. Oh, I didn't say who... I just said you were going to get married. Not Mr. Mason? No, it, it's Carl. Carl Davis. You remember? Carl? Uh-huh. Well, I, I think that's just fine, dear. He telephoned again. Carl? What did he say? He wanted to know where you were. I said he went to Mr. Mason's hotel to see him. Oh, swell. <laughs> then what did he say? <laughs> he said he'd be right over. <clears throat> you see? I'm coming, I'm coming. Merry Christmas, Timmy. Hi, darling. Carl, and look who's here. Mr. and Mrs. Ellis. Oh, hello, hello, Carl. Carl. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Connie just told us the news, Carl. We're so pleased. Yes, she finally talked me into it. <laughs> and look, look what Mr. Mason bought me. Oh, yes, the train. <laughs> so you saw Mason at his hotel? Well, no, Central Park. Uh, Central Park, dear? Yes, he eats there with the seals. <laughs> oh, well, did you give him back the money? He wouldn't take it. Well, it's a very expensive present. It does seem odd that he... Yes, is. doesn't it? It's just the kind of fellow he is. It, it doesn't seem odd at all. Well, what are you getting so upset about, honey? Oh, well, I... Look, I, I can't explain things better than I have, and I, I'm not even going to try. If there's anything about it that's bothering you, it can stop bothering you because... Well, because he's leaving town. He's going to Oregon to build boats. Going away. Boat, boat. So, so why don't we open up our, our presents and, and have a nice Christmas? Because there's somebody at the door. Oh, I'm closest, dear. I'll see who it is. Oh, Mr. Mason. No, Johnson Police Department. Oh, police? Well, what in the world? I'm looking for a uh, Mrs. Ennis. Well, I'm Mrs. Mrs. Ennis. Yeah, well, which one of you sat on a bench in Central Park this morning? Well? You know a man named Steve Mason? Yes. Yeah. Well, he's under arrest. He claims you can clear things up for him. Under arrest? The lieutenant will tell you all about it. Get your coat, dear. I'm going to. Oh, no, no, dear. Of course not. You... I've got him. He's my friend, isn't he? Oh, well, all right, but hurry. Well, I I don't hurry. Right, now, please. And you just stand there, Mason, and keep quiet. I'm running things around this police station. I just wanted to introduce you. Connie, Carl, this is Lieutenant Bolt. How do you do? 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, at 9 a.m. in Central Park, a Mr. Marvin Fisher was hit on the head, tied up with a necktie, robbed of 52 bucks and some silver salt and pepper shakers, a present for his aunt in Flushing. A little later, Officer McCreary notices this guy. Uh, me. He's loitering, see? He admits he's homeless and unemployed. But that doesn't Mrs. mean... Mrs. Ennis, you're interrupting me. <laughs> he also admits that the necktie belonged to him and he's got the salt and pepper shakers on his uh, person. Uh, oh, I see. I made a joke. I'm sorry. I, I just thought it, it... It was going to be worse. Mr. Mason wouldn't hurt anybody. Uh, thanks, pal. Lieutenant, I'm a lawyer. Oh, is that so? Well, if I ever need a lawyer, I'll look you up. And if I ever need a comical cop, I'll send for you. I'm defending this man uh, with your permission, Mason. And with my profound gratitude, but with probably no fee. Why isn't Marvin Fisher here to identify the suspect? Because he didn't see who hit him. Lieutenant, I think I can clear this all up. Well, if Clarence Darrow here doesn't object... No, you have no idea how interested I am. I was with Mr. Mason in the park. He gave his necktie to a man he thought was a hobo. A few minutes later, a little girl on roller skates with, with a balloon on her head came up with a present for him from the hobo. The salt and pepper shakers. A little girl with a balloon on her head. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Would you mind telling me whether a complaint has been lodged against Mr. Mason? What's he got to do with this anyway? He's my lawyer. And he's my fiance. Your fiance? Then what are you doing in the park with this guy? Well, I I had to see him and and he was in the park. He eats there with the seals. <laughs> And early this morning, a train arrived, an electric train for my little boy here, from Mr. Mason. Oh, the guy's broke, no job, but he buys a kid an electric train. Why? Well, let's just say I felt like giving some kid a present and I didn't know anybody else in New York. Is that why you gave the hobo your necktie? Oh, that. Well, well, I had just given Mr. Mason a new tie, the one he's wearing now. Yes, it was under our tree. It was one of the presents she had for Carl. <laughs> You don't say. The romantic relationships of the parties involved are entirely irrelevant. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and why did he try to hide behind a rock when he saw Officer McCrary? I wasn't hiding. I, I, I was, uh... Well? Oh, you'll never believe this. Well, go ahead. Try me. I was feeding a squirrel. He, uh, <laughs> he, he's an orphan. He kind of depends on me. Holy jumping ranger, get this guy out of here. You mean he's free to go? I gotta let him go, if he isn't planning to skip town. Oh, I'm not. I've got a room, 220 Christopher Street. Oh, now you've got a room. Well, just till I earn railroad fare, I've got a job out in Oregon. Well, why don't you touch the counselor for your fare? I bet he'd be glad to get you a ticket just to get rid of you. Now look, Lieutenant. Yeah, you look. This case is dismissed. Go on home. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Believe it or not, Steve... It only looked like I was trying to send you to the chair. <laughs> you did fine, thanks. And uh, why don't you let me advance you that train fare? Uh, much obliged, Carl, but I couldn't think of it. Why can't Steve come home with us now, Mom, and, and have dinner with us? Well, I, I'm sure he has plans of his own, dear. But how could he? He said he didn't know anybody but me. And besides, it costs a lot of money to eat in restaurants. Uh, thanks, Timmy. I'd love to, but I really can't. But, but why, Steve? Well, because I, um... Yes? Okay, I'll, I'll come. <laughs> and now, if no one has any objections, I'm going to make a little speech. I ate too much turkey. <laughs> yeah, so did I, but I'm going to make a speech just the same. Well, uh, just a toast, I guess. <laughs> All right. <isn't> <laughs> <laughs> to you, Mother, and to the 35 years you've given to me. Every one of them good. Even the bad ones, because you were with me. Oh, why, Henry? Carl, just be as happy with Connie as I've been with Mother. That's all. No, no, Mr. Ennis, that's not all. This has been the happiest Christmas of my life. From now on, I'll have a wife and son, and if Connie will let me share them, a mother-in-law and a father-in-law. And you, Steve, well, we all wish you luck in your new job in Oregon, and we're happy that you're not alone this Christmas, but with us. Thank yes, you. Yes, Thank you. indeed. Now it's your turn, Steve. you got to say something, too. No, I, I passed, Timmy. I'm too full. But that's not fair. You, you have to say something. Well... You've all been very kind to me. You've taken me in, given me a great dinner, and there's really nothing for me to say except uh, after we've had dessert, of course, except thank you and goodbye. That's all I was going to say, but, well, you asked for it. Connie, I think Carl's one of the swellest guys I could ever hope to meet. Well, here, here. Oh, fine. But I think you ought to marry me. Uh, I think we'd better go in the kitchen, Father. Oh, oh, yes, yes, the dessert and, and, and coffee. Uh, honestly, Mr. Ennis, I don't think anybody wants that just now. Maybe it's wrong of me to speak this way in front of Timmy, but I don't see how it can do a boy any harm to know that two men love his mother. Maybe it's bad taste to speak in front of Carl, but would it be better if I sneaked around and tried to get Connie behind the kitchen stove? I don't think so. And if you think this is biting the hand that fed me, then look at my problem. I've walked out of Connie's life a couple of times now, and... Each time, something brings me back. Lost packages, a train, a cop, accidents. I'm afraid I can't keep counting on accidents. If I walk out now, I'm sunk. I'll never see her again. The way I figure it, when a man's in love with a girl, he's got a right to ask her to marry him. Any girl. Anybody's girl. What do you say, Connie? I think you'd better get your hat and coat. Fair answer to a fair question. And I wish you all a very Merry Christmas. 
And that's that. Yes, dear. And that's that. In a few moments, we'll bring you Act Three of Holiday Affair. I chose our guest tonight because we always like to see effort and sustained hard work pay off. Miss Kate Christopher, our charming starlet, is an Illinois girl, a graduate of Northwestern University. Of course, you majored in dramatics, Kay. Oh, of course, Mr. Keeley. And I had two summer sessions at the University of Iowa. You know, they have a very splendid dramatic workshop there. So when you came to Hollywood, you weren't exactly a novice. Well, that's what I thought at the time, but goodness, what an ordeal my first screen part turned out to be. Especially the day the director got so angry when I just couldn't seem to get a scene just right. Well, yes, but you've been in many pictures since, so, well, you weren't too discouraged. Oh, my, no. It, as a matter of fact, it, it made me much more determined. Oh, and incidentally, Mr. Keeley, Faith Domerg, who stars in RKO's Vendetta, spent years of study before she even attempted a screen role. Oh, she's a terrific actress, and very beautiful besides. You know, she seems just right for the intensely dramatic part she plays. A proud young Corsican girl bent on the revenge of her father's murder. You know, Vendetta fairly seethes with human emotions. And Faith Domerg has that dark, exciting kind of beauty that's just right in the mood of the story. Oh, and how gorgeous she is in those close-ups. Everyone will agree with you there, Kay. Her dark hair and eyes certainly set off that luxe complexion of hers. Yes, Mr. Kennedy, Faith is a luxe girl, like most Hollywood stars. And I certainly would neglect my daily luxe soap facial. And for a luxurious beauty bath, of course, the bath size cake is just wonderful. Yes, that big bath size makes a hit with women everywhere. The lather is so rich and creamy, even in hardest water. It's active lather, you know, that leaves skin feeling extra soft and smooth. And that fragrance is so delightful, just like spring flowers. A really subtle perfume that's a, a blend of many costly flower fragrances. Thank you, Miss Kay Christopher, for being here tonight. Now, here's a suggestion to all the ladies in our audience. Try Lux Toilet Soap in the generous satin-smooth bath size. Depend on it for all over Lux loveliness, as famous screen stars do. Put this luxurious soap on your shopping list tomorrow. It makes a fine gift to slip in a Christmas stocking. Remember, nine out of ten screen stars use fragrant white Lux Toilet Soap. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Curtain rises on Act Three of Holiday Affair, starring Robert Mitchum as Steve and Lorraine Day as Connie. Well, it's the day after Christmas. Santa Claus has come and gone, and so has Steve Mason. And in Crowley's department store, a small boy with a large box has struggled through the crowds to Mr. Crowley's office. Mr. Crowley. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Crowley. Emily, don't you know I'm listening to our radio program? Yes, Mr. Crowley, but I... This is Crowley and Company's meditation hour. Five minutes more of this and I'll be fast asleep. I'm sorry, sir, but one of our customers wants to see you. Nothing doing. I hate customers. Well, I, I think you'll want to see this one. He's roughly seven years old. He seems to be in a lot of trouble. Well, uh, turn off the radio and send him in, Emily. Come on in, Timothy. That's Mr. Crowley behind that desk. Ah, young man. You have something in the box, I see. Possibly some belated Christmas gift for me? No, sir. It, it's an electric train. Oh, is that so? Well, I hope it hasn't proved unsatisfactory. Well, I, I got two of them for Christmas. So please, can I have my money back? Well, now, let me see that train. What's this? What's this? It, it got broken in the elevator, but I didn't do it. Honest. No dramatics, boys, no dramatics. I hate dramatics. So you got two trains for Christmas, huh? No, no, no. I'll tell you the truth. Oh? I only got this one train for Christmas. 
This Steve guy for me, he's my friend. And he's real poor and he hasn't got a job. And, and he shouldn't have spent his money and I don't want to give it back to him. No, 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 no tears, boy. It gets me all squishy, you know. Yes, sir. Uh, just tell me this tale of woe from the beginning, huh? Well, well, I, I guess it all started with my mother. Her name is Mrs. Ennis, and, and she worked for Fisher and Lewis. <laughs> She's a comparison shopper. Whoops. Uh, anyway, she came here to your Connie, darling, please get hold of yourself. We've done everything we can. But Carl, Timmy's been gone for hours now. Oh, where could he be? What could have happened to him? Now, honey, you just can't go to pieces like this. The police have a full description of him. Why, he's probably what just... What about the hospitals? What if there's been an accident? But there's and... been no report of an accident. <laughs> oh, Connie, now look, darling, it won't do any good just standing here and staring out of the window. Look, I'll go out again. Now, you can either come with me or, or better yet... Carl, it... hmm? Carl, look, down there on the street. Oh, well, that... that's Timmy. Getting out of that car. But who's that man? And look, a chauffeur. Timmy! Timmy! Mom, Mom, I'm back! Timmy! Oh, darling. Darling, are you all right? Well, sure. Where have you been all afternoon? And who was the man in that car? Mr. Crowley, he's nice. He said he had a, wish he had a boy just like me instead of just his mother-in-law. Mr. Crowley? <laughs> you mean Mr. Crowley from Crowley's department store? Yeah. But that's miles from here, way downtown. I know, I almost got run over him twice. Run over and killed twice. Oh, Timmy. Oh, it's okay, I didn't. But why did you go to Crowley's? I... I took my train back. Oh, but why, honey? You, you loved it so. Oh, my poor baby. It cost too much. Steve hasn't got a job, and, and Mr. Crowley gave me the money back. Will you give the money to Steve, Mom? Please, Mom, he needs it. Well, well, we don't know where he lives, Timmy. 220 Christopher Street. Remember, he said so in the police station. And tell him I didn't take the train back because I didn't like it. We'll tell him, sweetheart. Oh, Carl, all of a sudden, I've got a big grown-up boy. Well, this is it, honey. 220 Christopher Street. Carl, you give him the money. I, I think I, I'd better wait out here. You do? Connie, Connie, let's have a talk for a minute, huh? Hmm? In the case of Connie Ennis versus Carl Davis, I'd like to offer certain facts and evidence. I don't understand. The party of the first part, Connie Ennis, although loved by the party of the second part for three long years, successfully did avoid the idea of marriage between them. However, upon the entrance of a stranger into her life, said Connie Ennis, did immediately and suddenly consent to this marriage. But there's no possible connection between... Since meeting the stranger, Connie Ennis, normally calm and frank, becomes nervous and evasive. Carla, I don't think I like that. And you. upon a proposal of marriage from the stranger, a thing rarely insulting to women, she becomes outraged and orders him from her home. Well, for your sake, I, I couldn't... Nevertheless, have... having heard his address but once, she remembers it. Yet she's fearful of seeing him again. I don't know why you're saying these things. It's my business to recognize facts, Connie. I'm a lawyer. And in six days, I'll be a lawyer's wife. Will you? You know, I have a sneaking suspicion I ought to see if somewhere there isn't a girl who might be in love with me. Even a dumb, frowsy blonde who slops up the house and feeds me on canned beans. Carl. Now, go on, go on in and give him the money. I'll wait five minutes. And if you don't find more interesting company, well, then we still have a... Date for dinner. You're a wonderful person, Carl. Yeah, yeah. Compliments will get you no place. Come on in. Oh, it's you. Well, sit down. I'm just putting a pot of coffee on the burner. Thank you, but I'm... Oh, uh, wait. I'll close the door. Uh, the, the landlady said to keep the door open. Uh, let's worry you, huh? I have $79.50, plus tax, that belongs to you. You know, I'm going to get sore if people don't quit chasing me around trying to give me money. Well, this is from Timmy. He took the train back to Crowley's all by himself. 
But why would he do that? I thought he was crazy about it. Oh, he was. But he wants you to have the money. <laughs> what a kid. Everything else all right? Well, everything else is... is fine. Well, and it looks like a happy new year all around, huh? Mm -hmm. I can shake myself loose from this penthouse, grab the first cheap train to Oregon, and you and Carl will be getting set for your honeymoon. Carl and, and I are not getting married. Oh? Well, I guess that's my cue to propose again. But I'm not going to. Nobody asked you to. Wouldn't you like to know why? Not particularly. Well, I'll tell you anyway. Carl isn't the, the real threat to me, Connie. Maybe I'm not to him either. This isn't two fellows and a girl, you know. This is two fellows, a girl, and her husband. I can't fight a shadow. I tried. The competition's too tough. You were even going to play it safe and settle for someone you didn't love so you wouldn't be unfaithful to your husband. Oh, you're always so wrong about me. I have a wonderful memory of a husband and a marriage. You're trying to take it away from me. Nobody wants to do that. I don't, and I'm sure Carl doesn't. All anybody wants is for you to live in the present and not be afraid of the future. To quit pretending that something that's dead is still alive. All right, if it'll make you any happier. I want everything just the way it is. Mrs. Status Quo. Just Timmy and I, no changes. And all I want is a girl who'll drop everything and run to me, no matter what the score is. Well, maybe you'll find her, Steve. Goodbye. Here we go again. Always saying goodbye. I hope you'll find what you're looking for, Connie. Yes, and maybe something you're not looking for. Good luck. Well, I'm back, Carl. Well, what happened? It seems everybody wants a frowsy blonde this year. Guess I'm just not the type. Didn't you even put up a fight? Oh, Carl, please take me home. Sure. Sure, honey, I'll take you home. And in a few more hours, it'll be a brand new New Year, huh, Mom? That's right, darling. But if we don't stop talking, I'm going to be late for my party. Mom, what did that telegram say before? Oh, just Happy New Year, dear. From Grandpa and Grandma? Well, no, it, it was from Steve. Now, where's my lipstick? Here, I... I guess I had it. I was drawing some pictures. Oh, fine. Is that all the telegram said? It said that he'll be wishing us a happy new year tonight on the train. He's finally going to Oregon. Now, go to bed when Mary tells you, dear. Where's the party, Mom? Russ and Harriet? Mm -hmm. Going alone, huh? You don't have any fun anymore, huh? Well, I've got you, haven't I? You're my fella. Oh, sure, but heck, I'll be running out and getting married pretty soon. <laughs> Well, not tomorrow, anyway. But when I do, you'll be all alone. I mean, uh, what if I move away? Well, where do you have in mind? Cairo or, or Baghdad? Oh, there's lots of places. Oregon, for instance. Of course, I'd write you a lot, but what I mean is... I know exactly what you mean. Boy, when you start growing up, you don't waste any time, do you? What are you thinking about, Mom? Well, since your plans are all made, maybe I ought to be thinking about my future. Come on, young man. You and I have things to do. Hmm? But I don't get it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you all about it later. On our way to the station. The railroad station? But I still don't get it. Is there a Mr. Mason in this car? Mr. Mason, please. Steve Mason. Oh, yes, conductor? Uh, I have a note for you. For me? Oh, thanks. Uh, we hope you like surprises, too, Connie and Timmy. Car 269, Mr. Mason, Section D. Thank you. Steve. Well, I, I dropped everything, darling. I ran. Gee, Steve, the real train's even been on an electric train. Connie and Timmy. Well, what do you know? Uh, look out the window, Timmy. You uh, may see something interesting. Huh? Oh, oh, yeah. 
Can I turn around now? Are you through kissing? Uh-oh. The curtain falls on Holiday Affair, and all our thanks to our stars for making this such a happy occasion. Robert Mitchum and Lorraine Day. Well, Bob, I suppose you're all set to play Santa to your two boys. I sure am, Bill. But they're growing up awfully fast, you know. Jim's nine and Chris is seven. They're regular giants. Giants? Did you say giants? You're speaking of the men I love. <laughs> Lorraine, you literally live for the New York Giants, don't you? Yes, Bill, from spring training through the baseball season. But that goes from March clear through September. You ought to play on the team. <laughs> Just a minute, Bob. Our season goes through October. Next year, the Giants will be playing in the World Series. Oh. My, 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 such <laughs> faith. You know, I bet she believes in Santa Claus. I bet she does, too. I certainly do. I have the New York Giants and Leo DeRocher. And what do you have? Well, you can have Leo. I have Jane Russell in our new R RKO picture, His Kind of Woman. <laughs> well, to each his own. How about your children, Lorraine? I suspect they're giant fans. Well, my boy Chris certainly is. He has a miniature giant suit and Leo DeRocher's number on the back of it. Oh, how about your little girl, Michelle? Oh, she's a Lux Toilet Soap fan, just like her mother. I tell her that if she uses it faithfully, she might be a starlet someday. I'll bet on that. You know, the only thing that impressed my kids is that I was in a hop-along Cassidy picture once. Now they want him for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know they're all set to get wonderful presents. And we have one for them, too. Because next week, on Christmas night, we're presenting a storybook classic that grown-ups love as much as their children do. The wonderful tale that metro golden Mayor turned into an enchanting musical, The Wizard of Oz. And as our star playing her original role, the one and only Judy Garland. I'm sure you'll agree it's a wonderful Christmas present. Yes, Bill, everyone will certainly love that. Good night. Good night, Bill. Good night and Merry Christmas. Santa Claus is on his way. And here's a wonderful new idea for helping him trim your Christmas tree. Make a snow-like frosting with Lux Flakes. Your tree, your, your table decorations, too, will look as if they're covered with freshly fallen snow. It's easy to make, and even the children can put it on. Wonderfully inexpensive, too. Frost your tree before you put on lights and other trimmings. Christmas snow dries in a few hours, lasts as long as the tree. To make it, here's all you do. Just add two cups of lukewarm water to a box of Lux Flakes whipped to a creamy consistency. Spread handfuls along the branches of your tree with your fingers. Buy an extra box of Lux Flakes tomorrow to trim your tree. Your dealer has complete printed directions for making Christmas snow with Lux Flakes. Tonight is the beginning of Christmas week. A joyful time for renewing old friendships, strengthening family ties, and the American freedom to worship in your church. Our wish is not only for our America, but for the world, that soon the age-old promise will be fulfilled, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. On behalf of Lieber Brothers Company and all of us here in the Lux Radio Theater, may I wish all of you... A joyous Christmas. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz. This is William Keeley bidding you good night. in our cast tonight were Gordon Giebert as Timmy and Wally Mayer as Carl. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Wizard of Oz starring Judy Garland. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.